What drives people to go prospecting for gold? I have no clear answer. But if I had to give one, I'd say gold fever. The man most struck by gold fever wandered north once the great California gold rush was over. They went there after hearing that Indians traded with gold nuggets in the interior of British Columbia. Gold today still has the same fascination as 150 years ago. Afflicted by gold fever, I went on a tour to explore a gold region that was new to me. I associate my report about wandering in the once rich gold fields of the Caribou with wandering back through an equally rich history. It was a privileged tour, but I did not always feel so. Sometimes I felt uneasy, so alone in the vastness of Canada. But I was privileged compared to the situation of the gold prospectors 150 years ago, back in the times when Vancouver did not yet exist. I had a small rental car and some mobile gold prospecting equipment that I bought in prospecting stores around Vancouver. I did not want to leave the bedrock untouched in the many creeks along the road that I was planning to drive. The gold rush began in the year 1858 on the Fraser River. At that time this was the center of gold prospecting. The Fraser River is the largest river in British Columbia and drains into the Pacific near Vancouver. Shortly before its mouth the Fraser River crosses the coast mountains in a massive canyon. It soon became apparent that the sandbanks, called bars, were extremely auriferous. The old town of Yale originated as a collection of tents and huts. The rich banks, for example the Hills Bar below Yale or the Boston Bar, have been yielding fine placer gold for years. The search for gold was no picnic, it was a tough fight. The cleverer prospectors knew the gold source, the mother load, must be located upriver. It must be far richer than the Fraser River gold. Therefore, daring men fought their way 800 kilometers upstream over rough terrain to the interior. In 1859, about 300 prospectors had made their way up to the confluence of the Genel and the Caribou River, two tributaries of the Fraser River. A small town was established, Genel Forks. Today, Genel Forks is a ghost town, which means that no one lives there anymore. Some reminders of Cummins are still standing and have been fondly restored. In the years after 1859, hundreds and then thousands of prospectors came. Canal Forks became the starting point of the Caribou gold fields. Many moved on because more gold deposits were discovered further upstream in the meantime. In 1865 the Caribou Wagon Road, the first road along the Fraser River, opened. It ran through Williams Lake rather than Canal Forks. Barkerville superseded Canal Forks as the base camp of the Caribou gold fields. Canal Forks was taken over by the Chinese. The Chinese prospectors followed the Westerners at many gold sites. They worked the same gold deposits again. However, they worked much more accurately and more persistently and therefore achieved good gold finds once again. The 
last inhabitant of Canal Forks was the Chinaman Wong Kwai Kim. He died in 1957 in a snowstorm on his way back from Likely. The post office of Canal was moved to Likely in 1923, which is 10 kilometers away. The small town of Likely is today the last settlement on the old road to the Caribou Goldfields. The town, more precisely a few houses, a pub, a shop and a petrol station, will be my base camp to the Caribou Goldfields for the next few days. I stay overnight in the likely lodge and pub. I can't remember when I stayed in such a small room before. The door cannot be locked, but the shared shower works perfectly and the burgers at the pub are better than anywhere. Likely originates from the second generation of the gold rush, the time of hydraulic mining. The gold rush that washed away the hills began in the 1890s and ended in the 1940s. Big consortiums bought the claims of the few remaining gold prospectors. Huge amounts of gravels were washed away with monitors of up to 30 cm or 11.5 inches in diameter, until the rich ancient river deposits came to light. The results are large pits shot such as the drop pit. In Likely I meet Mickey, a professional placer miner. His claim is about an hour's drive outside of Likely. I follow Mickey on the dusty road upstream the Caribou River and then along the Caribou Lake. There, where Mickey turns towards the mountains, Two men staked the claim in spring 1860. William Doc Kitley and Isaiah Diller were among the first who advanced from Canal Forks in search of the mother load. The newspapers soon reported that the richest claim up to then had been found. Kitley's claim yielded one quarter of kilogram of gold per man per day by simple mining techniques. The quiet river was named Keatley Creek after the discoverer. When this became known, the quiet was gone. Every stone was turned, first by the Westerners, a few years later by the Chinese. To retrieve the last crumb of gold, the Chinese piled the stones so neatly in the same place that the artificial mountain is still visible today. Mickey drives uphill from the Keatley Valley and turns into a side valley. Up here, at about 1000 meters above sea level, he staked a claim several years ago. He spent six months a year in a simple container house, together with his wife and three dogs. There is a lot to organize. Eight car batteries, a solar panel and a diesel generator provide for the power supply. Excavators, trucks and a gold mining plant must be kept in shape. Oh, three bedrooms. That's how a little miner's home looks like. This area was covered by mighty glaciers thousands of years ago. The rivers distributed the gold over the landscape during the glacial melt and concentrated it in certain places. But Mickey's large sluice and trommel that breaks up the muddy gravel have not been running for two years. What happened? Placer mining, as the mining from old auriferous riverbeds is called, is very strictly regulated in British Columbia. For example, no waste of water can be directed into the streams. To make it worse, the quick gold was found by the old timers and the Chinese 150 years ago.
Mickey's speculation goes that there is a hotspot hidden at a great depth near the fork of two creeks. So deep that the pick and shovel gold miners 150 years ago had no chance to reach it, because there was too much groundwater present. Mickey dug a hole 15 meters deep with the aid of his excavator. He is not allowed to go any deeper mechanically that close to a stream course. Therefore, his plan is to sink a shaft another 10 meters by hand. Nearby, someone tried to sink a shaft in the 1930s. The remnants are still visible. We would so much like to know about the past and the future success. Eventually, Mickey is not satisfied enough with the gold content at a depth of 15 meters. The content is not yet worth the effort to put his gold mining plant to work. The very rich gold concentrations are generally lying on the bedrock, the very bottom of the riverbed. So I am allowed to pan a bit from this cavern. The sun is burning down from the sky. It is hot at around 28 degrees Celsius, but that does not prevent me sweating for three hours while panning. The results are some small gold flakes. But Mickey's finds show that there is gold hidden in the ground. The mountains in this area reach a high of 2000 meters. One of these, Yang's Peak, rises behind Mickey's claim. The next day we climb Yang's Peak in Mickey's Park, a slightly larger Altera vehicle. We are accompanied by the two dogs while we drive uphill on an old rough path. A trapper cut the track at his own expense, so that he could trap animals by snowmobile during winter. The bush is so dense that one would hardly have a chance to get through without the pass. Well, it was one of the first ones, yes. Yeah. Most of the meadows in the El is the glacier stopped there. And if the glacier stopped and melted, then it usually left with lots of gold. You can kind of see over the edge here that uh, uh, we'll find an opening somewhere. There are many traces of gold mining around Yang's Peak. There was a lot of hard rock mining in the 1930s. Galleries and remains of buildings are still visible, but the buildings have all collapsed. There are still artifacts found in the adits. Yeah. Mickey even yeah. found okay. sticks of dynamite. It might have been uh, well examined by yeah. some treasure hunters. And yeah, there's not people. much left. The road used to be... I used to come up here... There might even be somewhere, I think I found a label on it once. Oh yeah, there. Oh, yeah. there it is, yes. Yeah. 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 Ken wants to haul this home and use it for something. Okay. <laughs> We start our way down into the valley of Little Snowshoe Creek. Here, on the backs of Yang's Peak, the road is extremely bad. The rains have washed deep trenches into the ground. Someone has cut the fallen trees into pieces with a chainsaw. They had been blocking the road before. That idiot put the trees lengthwise rather than crosswise. Mickey is upset. 
He argues that the road will not be passable this way in the future. We need to consider turning back, but Mickey persists. He crosses this critical passage superbly. Just that easy. Ah. Yeah, but it works. Hey, congratulations, you got it. Bedrock, I'm looking for. No, no, it's all buried by glaciers. Yeah. And if there was bedrock, it would have been torn up so many times that uh, every placer miner in the world. There's no rocks left in this creek at one time, they were all taken out. There's rock piles like you wouldn't believe. There is probably no more gold left in the valley of Little Snowshoe. This valley is completely emptied. Shafts and tunnels were dug everywhere. One of these tunnels along the bedrock were said to be more than one kilometer long. Large stone piles rise up everywhere. Many prospectors were active here and some top. simply could not stop to turning over the valley floor again and again. They all hoped to hit big gold so close to the primary deposits of the Yangs Peak, a possible mother load. A handful of pioneers, the so-called snowshoe boys, remained for decades after the gold rush had already gone. William Lewis was one of these snowshoe pioneers. He worked the claim from 1860 and ran a small hotel in his log cabin. His nickname was Live Yank and Yank's Peak was named after him. William Lewis had been searching for gold on Little Snowshoe for over 20 years. He spent the winters in his cabin as one of the small number of snowshoe boys. He died in 1881 and was buried in the local cemetery, the Snowshoe Cemetery. The wooden headplate of his grave is at the museum. The one in the cemetery is a replica. Graveyards and the stone piles of the gold prospectors are the last original relics of the old gold rush days. There's two graves missing. There should be two more people in here than there's graves sets. Okay. Here rest the pioneers. They sleep with the nuggets. As the claims were staked and rudimentarily exploited on Keatley and Snowshoe, four daring men, including John Rose and Doc Keatley himself, urged further north in autumn 1860. They went across the Snowshoe Plateau and came down into a valley they called Antler Valley. Antler Creek was the key to the caribou treasure. I absolutely wanted to see this historic area, but heavy rains did me welcome. The next day the sun shone and I decided to hike along Antler Creek, guided by an old map. Amos Bowman mapped the Caribou gold fields some 25 years after the gold discoveries. This 1885 map still impresses today because of its remarkable details and beauty. Bowman's map shows all the pioneer claims. This is a great basis to dream of the old timers that lived here in simple cabins 150 years ago whilst hiking. Remnants of old weathered log cabins can still be found every now and then by the wayside. These are probably relics of the last lonely prospectors from the 20th century. Today, only one modern prospector runs a place mining operation on Upper Antler Creek. But nobody is at home. When the four men, including Rose and Keatley, came to the headwaters of Antler Creek in autumn 1860, they found the creek running on bedrock and gold nuggets lying around on the bare bedrock. Two ounces in one pan, four ounces in the other. An Eldorado. 
Surprisingly, I discovered there is still bedrock here today. However, I have come without the gold pan. Therefore, I fill up a plastic bag with bedrock material. However, to my surprise, a single gold flake cannot be found in that material. It is unbelievable how accurately this creek has been cleaned up. During the hike, I delightfully indulge in old stories. For example, the lovingly drawn discovery claim on the Bowman map. hike continues through pretty pine forest. The aim of my walk is an old log cabin on the headwaters of Antler Creek, the rhubarb cabin. It has collapsed but is, is still relatively good shape. It rests on a rock head in the middle of the valley and dates back to the late 1920s. The gold deposits of Antler Creek were extremely rich, but only for a short distance of a few kilometers. Whoever came too late got no claim. Therefore, some gold diggers like William Dietz pushed even further northward. They staked claims on a creek that was named after him, Williams Creek. This creek was revealed to be even richer than Antler Creek. It was the richest creek in the Caribou. A certain Billy Barker got a claim at Williams Creek in summer 1861. Barker is something of a folk hero in today's British Columbia. But Barker and his colleagues first found little gold on their claim. They must have been upset. Barker impatiently staked a second claim on Williams Creek in early summer 1862, knowing very well that this was not allowed. His second claim was further downstream, just below a small canyon. That era was considered worthless. The bedrock lay deep down. Was it despair, chance or luck? In July 1862, Barker sold his upper claim because he could indeed own only one. A few days later, the new buyers struck the gold-bearing gravel layer one of the richest up to that time. Barker must have been very desperate, but the legend goes that Barker had a dream shortly after his arrival in the Caribou. He dreamed of a number 52 again and again. Therefore he dug to a depth of 52 feet, 16 meters, a depth so far not yet reached by hand methods at that time. There he struck the gold layer on bedrock in August 1862. A gold pan full of gravel out of that paste drake contained 10 grams of gold. A new settlement of tents and huts emerged, Barkerville. Barkerville is the only town that remains from the gold rush era. It is a kind of open air museum today. It was a respectable town with 6,000 inhabitants at Barker's time. The place must have looked like an enormous labyrinth of water supply lines, water wheels, shafts, tunnels, stone piles, huts and tents at that time. There are virtually no trees because the wood was used for all that constructions. I made a short stop 
in Lillouette on the Fraser River on my way back to Vancouver. A final gold prospecting experience tempted me. I wanted to test the Cayouche Creek. The Cayouche is only 10 km away of Lillouette. Thousands of prospectors went by Lillouette on their way to the Caribou. But this creek, with its coarse gold nuggets, was not discovered until 30 years later by Chinese prospectors. Climbing down that steep valley, the thermometer indicates 33 degrees Celsius. It is pleasantly cool down at the river shore, and I find some tiny gold flakes. Bedrock crops out on the opposite side of the river, but it is not accessible despite my long boots. Yes, the gold trails and locations that vibrated under the feet of thousands of prospectors are now largely overgrown and forgotten. My destinations, Barkerville, Gennell Forks, Antler or Snowshoe, those little jewels away from the big tourist centers, have preserved the atmosphere of the discovery years. Here forests have taken back their space, but the vastness of the caribou, however, has not changed. The creeks that once yielded up to 2.5 tons of gold flow quietly and peacefully once more. Today this is the land for gold rush nostalgics like me to wander in the footsteps of the past far away from civilization.